so good to see you here today. I appreciate you being here. Um, I know it sounds just like so much preacher talk, but I, I really do mean it. It's a privilege. Uh, anytime I get to be with you and open the Word of God up, uh, it's because the Word of God, I don't know how to describe it, it's just full, and it's just full of good. You can't get close to the Word of God without getting better off because of it. So uh, I guess it'd be about like being a good cook, Miss Shirley, and making chocolate cakes at Stan Yeah, High. Mm -hmm. yeah. Folk just benefit from stuff like that, amen? Amen. It's the way it is with the Bible. <laughs> Honestly, uh, and I say this with all seriousness, if I can just get out of God's way uh, when I attempt to preach, then everything's going to be fine. Because this is what's the good thing. It hasn't got anything at all to do with me. Uh, it really does. Anyway, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to be reading verse 3 and verse 4 from Hebrews chapter 13. I've entitled my message this morning, Why Heaven Will Work. Why Heaven Will Work. Donna just looked at me like, say what? <laughs> Hebrews 13, 3 and 4, I'll read in just a moment, but before we do that, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. I mean that in all sincerity. I want you to pray that God will help us here today. Because again, uh, I can't say it uh, long enough or loud, but I have nothing, absolutely nothing. But God's book is full, chock full. Pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, we're asking for another blessing. It would almost seem, Lord, to be what disrespectful, I come for so many blessings, and maybe others just like me here today. We come for so many blessings. You never turn us away empty-handed. You always meet the need, sometimes one way, sometimes another way. Maybe that's one of the reasons we're not given the particulars in the story of you feeding the thousands with the handful, only that you did it. And because it reminds us that there's no set way for you, you're just God and you do. And we just love you and praise you. And so not meaning anything, Lord, but to express our utter destitution. We're asking God for a blessing through your word today. Something that we can carry away. Something that you intended through this passage that will make us better disciples. For your praise, your glory, and your pleasure. We ask it in Jesus' name, Lord, and thank you for the same. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 3. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Why? Heaven will work. If you back up into chapter 12, where we've spent some time, to me, possibly, verses uh, 22 and 24 through 24, possibly the most direct perspective setter in all the Word of God, uh, as far as focusing in our attention on what's really important. Uh, one other verse came to mind, which may be a close second, as far as being short and succinct and making a point. Amos 4.12, he said, prepare to meet thy God. That's rather plain, amen? This basically says the same thing, but in 12.22 through 24, uh, it pictures, if you will, uh, a scene, something like this anyway. All men, all women, all young people who are still alive on earth, standing maybe by the bank of a wide river. And whoever wants to can look across that river and in the distance see eternity. It's there, whether we see it or not. Amen? It really is. So how do you know that? Well, because the Bible says it's there. And that's all it takes for us. And in that distance, and 
as we're looking, as it were, through the lenses of Hebrews 12, 22 and following, in the distance there we can see the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem. We see an innumerable number of angels, and there stand all the saints who once stood on the same side of the river that we're on now. Just barely, just barely with the eye of flesh, we can see God, the judge of all men, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and there he stands, and according to the word of God, clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And he calls out to all, come. And it's as if he's standing and he's waiting and he's watching to see who will look his way. And that being the case, obviously, we're told in verse 25, see that you refuse not him that speaks. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. And we've been looking at the idea of serving God acceptably. Well, how do we do that? Verse 28 told us how that was to be done. We're to have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. Now, the word have there, this helps me. I hope it does you literally translates, hold it, to hold it. That's why the translator said you've got to have it. You've got to have grace, if you will. In order to serve God acceptably, we've got to be in possession of grace. Not aware of it, not familiar with it, not at one point in my life particularly fond of it, but we've got to have grace. Amen. We've got to hold it in our hands. Somebody says, all right, I'd buy that. What's grace? What is it we've got to hold and to have? Well, according to Titus 2, verse 11 and 12, perfect definition of what grace is, Paul wrote, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust." We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Grace, if you will, is that predisposition in God's character to speak to us and to tell us how to live right. So in other words, if we want to serve God acceptably, we're not going to refuse what He has to say to us. Rather, we're going to listen to His Word. We're going to learn His Word. We're going to obey His Word. We're going to deny ungodliness, worldly lust. And we're going to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. But then he's given us, if you will, one more good motivator to help us serve God acceptably. And we've already read about that. There's going to be a shaking, and that shaking is going to shake earth and heaven. And that's, of course, when Jesus returns. One last facet to that stone, if you will. When he returns, Revelation 22:12. Jesus himself said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. The word reward there adds a good deal of flavor to that verse. It's the Greek word misthos. It means pay for service. It means your hire. It means your wage. So in other words, when Jesus returns, he's going to have with him your wages for what you've done, your hire for what he told you to do, your pay for how you did what he told you to do. Don't you like payday? Amen. I do. But I'm only going to like payday if I've earned the part that I think I'm going to get. An empty pay envelope would not be a blessing. Amen? Amen. That's a motivator, y'all, to serve him acceptably. Now talk about motivation to serve Him. If looking at eternity, if viewing saints and angels on a distant shore, if picturing Jesus returning with your pay does not motivate you to serve God acceptably, my notion is you're not spending enough time listening to the Word of God. You're not allowing the Word of God to do what it was intended to do. You're going to need to change what you're looking at. The way we get faith is how? Go to a seminar, take a class, sleep in the church pew. Uh-uh. It's by hearing the Word of God. Amen. Just that simple. What a blessing it is 
Chapter 13 then, if you will, the class syllabus for serving God acceptably. The class syllabus for serving God acceptably. Number one, keep your affection for fellow disciples. Number two, expect the miraculous help of God, which brings us to number three in the class syllabus of how to serve God acceptably. Remember, you are part of a body. Verse three, remember, you are part of a body. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and implied, remember them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. And the word remember there means to remind yourself, to recall to mind. Anybody here talk to yourself? I think most of us do. Uh, and I find myself talking to myself about half the time, reminding myself of what it is that I set out to do. Now, if you remember back in verse 2, uh, we were told, be not forgetful. Now, there's a different mental concept being pictured here, and I'm assuming that's why God chose two different words to use it. Be not forgetful literally meant lose out of mind or to neglect what you know. And verse 2 carried the practical meaning of as a disciple, don't neglect what you're learning from the Bible. It's not there for head baggage. It's not there to get a pin on your lapel. We've got to flesh it out. We've got to put it into practice. But verse 3 carries this practical meaning of reminding yourself of the relationship that you retain, sustain, excuse me, to all other disciples of Jesus being yourself in the body. Let me repeat that for my sake. Verse 3 carries the practical meaning of reminding yourself of the relationship that you sustain to all other disciples of Jesus, quote unquote from verse 3, being yourselves also in the body. A wonderful truth that we're learning about Bible study, uh, especially in our Wednesday night uh, study. And that's the fact that God goes way out of His way to make sure that we understand what it is He's saying. You ever talked with someone or been in the presence of, of someone who is so blooming smart, you're thinking, Wait till he falls asleep. Maybe I can get more out of what he's saying. <clears throat> Educated folk. I'm not one. And that's so I can make up words when I want to. I'm glad that God, I mean, he's high and lofty. He's gone way out of his way to reach down and help us grasp. Uh, just as a for instance, Jeremiah 19. We've been looking at the fact that he told Jeremiah to break a potter's vessel in the sight of the old people and the old priests in the city of Judah. There was no mistaking in their mind. Jeremiah said as he broke that clay vessel, if you will, this is what God's going to do to you if you don't do right. Could anybody miss that? No, not unless you're asleep. How about Revelation 3.20, my favorite verse, I think. Pictures Jesus standing at the door and knocking. All he wants to do is come in. He ain't trying to sell something. He's not collecting for you to sell. He wants you. And he wants to have fellowship with you. Can anybody miss that? Him standing there knocking. Matthew 11, verse 28. If you're weary, he says, if you're heavy laden, I got something you want. Amen. And it's better than sweet tea. It's rest. I can give you rest of soul. Now, to someone who's totally ambivalent to the things of God, someone to whom eternity is just a fantasy by the weak-minded, that verse communicates nothing. But to someone who's down, who's out, who's tried everything there is to try, finds no satisfaction anywhere in what others seem to get great satisfaction out of, rest is music to his ears. Amen. So what does God do? Speak like a highfalutin intellectual? No. 
He says something so that we can understand exactly. If you need rest, I got it. Aren't you glad, y'all? Yeah, hey, if you're here today and you don't have rest in here, if when it's just you all by your lonesome, head on the pillow at night in the dark, you're not satisfied, you don't have to stay there. And I'm not trying to sell you something. I'm telling you that God Himself has made Himself available to us, and you can't be locked up in a room with God and not be tickled, slammed to death. I don't know any way to put that. And then we've got 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 27. In fact, I'm going to turn over there so I don't misquote this. But He's given us another one of those pictures, and the only thing I know to say is that it's safe to say that he's reaching way down and trying to make sure we don't miss something. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You are the body of Christ and members in particular. Now God's not like me. He's just, you know, not a, a, a bag of hot air that needs a pressure relief valve. When he says something, every syllable is there purposely. You are the body of Christ, speaking to the disciples at Corinth, and you are members in particular. Now let me go ahead and say here, just in case anybody's fallen for this, we ain't talking about church members, okay? The, uh, the grammar used here is the idea of a picture of like a body that's got a great bunch of parts to it. Fingers, toes, knees. Who was it? Tommy's mama had what, 13 knees or some such thing? Not all at once, of course. <laughs> but that's what we're talking about. And I said, oh, he's pushing church membership. No, I like church membership. It's a good thing, but that ain't what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is that there are many parts, and these many parts make up a whole, and that whole is called the body. Christ. Amen. Now we ain't going to get to heaven and everybody fit on a puzzle board as a finger, a toe, an elbow, or a knee. Uh-uh. This is a word picture. This is an analogy. Christ is trying to get us to understand something here. He's picturing then for us that once a person has truly been born again. Now that too is an analogy. But it's in the book and it's real. That's not what we're talking about today. Once someone's really been born again, once a person really receives Jesus as the Bible reveals him, then we become a part of the body of Christ. You say, well, I didn't know that. Well, I'm not trying to be a wise guy, but that's why we got the Bible. He's telling us something we don't know. And the only way we know what we don't know about spiritual things, about eternal things, is the Word of God. Okay, so you're following me, sure. But we become a part of the body of Christ. Just like the fingers, toes, ears, eyes, so on and so forth, of a physical body. Many parts, but all the parts make up the whole. Now, anyone who receives Bible Jesus, and I'll pause there for just a minute, remember... The real Jesus is revealed in the Bible. There are all grades of Jesuses being portrayed all around. I just know of a few that come and touch our little small circle in this part of the world. If it's not Bible Jesus, it's phony baloney. Amen. It's man-made. We're in the habit these days, the 21st century, of making God to look the way we want Him to look. You go into the Bible, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, and read something about God, you think, that can't be right. That's not the God I know. It's a good chance you're telling the truth, because you don't know the real God. You've made some fabricated version of, and that's the one you know. But that don't work. Amen? They ain't the one Shirley Grimes. And you can fantasize all you want to. I think Marty is really Shirley Grimes in disguise. Uh, I think you're nuts. <laughs> I hope you get the point I make. But once a person comes and receives Bible Jesus, the Bible also says that we're literally adopted into the family of God. Amen. Amen. 
Now I've met some who evidently don't believe in adoption. They think they're the natural children of God. You know, they're one up on some of the rest of us. Wrong answer. If you're in the family of God, you're an adopted member. And just like in earthly families, it's not always easy to get along with family members. Can anybody give me a witness? And, I mean, this is not universally always the case, but I think it's universally sometimes the case. Who was it said to me not too long ago that relatives were like cheese? After about three days in the living room, it's time to open the door and flip it out. You hadn't heard that one. Mm. In earthly families, it's not always easy to get along. But in God's family, we have to get along. Have to. You've been saving up an amen for six months. Now's your chance. Have to. It ain't none of this I'm going to try business. Try uh, That's what family members do to your patients. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Listen, it's this serious, y'all. There's an aspect of evangelism. Let me pause for just a moment. You know the word evangelism? It literally means to tell the good news. That's what the word means. There's an aspect of evangelism that is only communicated by how church folks get along with one another. Amen. Did you know that? John 13, 35, this is Jesus. He knows a little bit about this, amen? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you're members of the same church. Amen? Miss Ann just woke up. She's shaking her head. No, that's exactly right. If you have love one to another, people can know you're a disciple of Jesus by the way you treat other disciples. In other words, turn it around the other way. What good would it do for us to tell folks we've got what you need if what they see out of us they don't want? It's like somebody trying to pull them off chitlins on. And where's Kent? He probably laid up six of them eating chitlins. <laughs> what you want are these chitlins. No, I don't want that. You're nuts. I'd rather go on a diet. And if you know me, you know how serious that is. <laughs> We're telling people, man, you need to get saved. You need to come to church. You need to be a part of what God's doing through His Word. And they look in the church and they see fussing and fighting and fueling and this, that, and that. I don't want that. How much of our evangelistic efforts have gone right out the window because what we've told people they need, they can't, they can't stomach it. Listen, getting along in God's family is not an option. Not if you're going to serve Him acceptably. You can serve Him unacceptably and fuss and fight and feud all you want to. But if you're going to walk with a God in godly fear and reverence, as the Bible tells us, that's not going to work. God didn't make us robots. Yeah, he didn't make us puppets so that when we get saved, He makes us act like we ought to. Wouldn't that be nice? You come to Christ this morning, go home, plug your cord into God's receptacle somewhere, and you wake up tomorrow morning, you act like Billy Graham. Wouldn't that be nice? Or if you get yourself in some kind of a you know mental mode, you maybe get in front of the mirror and start to hum, and God takes his strings, you know, like you would a marionette, and moves your hand, moves your leg, and moves your mouth. Wouldn't that be nice if it were so? Good night, what a time we'd have. How does God get us to do right? He tells us how to act and then we obey. Amen. Yes. He tells us how to act and then we obey. Amen. Now if you don't get to where He can tell you how to act, you're already busted. But if you hear what He says and don't do it, it's useless. This is the dynamic. That's why we have preaching. That's why we have teaching. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. We've got to hear it, and then we've got to do it. That's what He did instead of making us robots or puppets. 
be a whole lot easier on me if you'd made me a robot. Now, when I was a kid, y'all, robots were like space age. You know, Flash Gordon and all that kind of stuff. They tell me today they got robots for real. They, they can build a Toyota with no people. I don't even know why they want to do that. I need a blooming job. I don't need a robot. <laughs> and they got little robot men that reach down, grab a windshield, and grab a tire, and grab a lug nut, and grab a gas cap. You stand back and watch. Well, robot number 1492 looks like he needs a break. <laughs> So that's probably not a good choice of words, but it's the only one I know. He didn't make us, y'all, robots. But he told us how to act and to communicate to us the absolute necessity of harmony in his church. He gave us 1 Corinthians 12. In fact, verse 13 and following is this whole uh, uh, shoot match, if you will, of this thing, the body of Christ. God goes out of his way, y'all, to help folks understand. And he had to for me. Amen? I'm going to tell you a true story. Some of y'all look at me like, that ain't the truth. This is a true story. I was in like third grade on a history test. Teacher wanted to know, what's the definition of a patriot? A patriot. I think it was Virginia history we were studying. Well, I wrote down on the paper, she took the papers up, and five, ten minutes later, she bust out laughing over there. Well, that's standard for me. But my answer was, somebody that loves his wife more than he does his country. Or country more than his life, whatever. Anyway, somehow wife got in there instead of life. That's why I enjoyed third grade several times. <laughs> Twelve, thirteen, First Corinthians. By one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. But y'all, that's already heavy duty. I mean, what does that mean? Well, it obviously means something to God, or He wouldn't have put it in there. And though I can't grasp it or fathom it, I know it's so. Whether you be Jew, Gentile, bond free, we're all made to drink into one spirit. The body is not one member but many. Now remember, this is God trying to get somebody like me to grasp this, you know. Understand what a patriot really means. Understand this body of Christ now. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not in the body, is it therefore not of the body? <clears throat> this is God talking, y'all. This ain't Junior. If the ear says, because I'm not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where, where the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them in the body as it's pleased Him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now they are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more of those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant coming. I, someone explained that to me one day. There's some parts of some folks that's kind of pretty. You ever known somebody with pretty hands or pretty feet? You ever known someone with a pretty spleen? <laughs> An attractive kidney? A nice looking liver? But they tell me you got to have them all. And I don't think they figured out what that appendix over here is for. I think it's just to give doctors a way to earn some cash. You know, they need a new boat or something. I don't know what to do. All these things that don't appear to be anything to look at, God says, hey, they're important even though they ain't pretty. Now think, it, this is God talking, not some fly-by-night evangelist on TV with a blue hair do purr. God trying to help me grasp there's something here for me to get. I'm part of a body. And a body's got a lot of pieces and a lot of parts. Our comely parts have no need, but God's tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that 
part which lacked, that there should be, here it is, no schism in the body. But that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. One member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Now, y'all, who can't grasp the concept, and I'm adding a little here, but for my sake, that Jesus says, my church is like a body with all of its various parts. Yeah. Fingers, toes, elbows, knees, so on and so forth. Ask a couple questions. Anybody here ever hit your thumb with a hammer? Anybody here did that on purpose? <laughs> no, I've never known anybody that did. I did hit the same thumb twice in one day. And I honestly looked at my hammer. We were over working on the water. I looked at the sound. I thought, you'll never do that again. <laughs> As if it was the hammer's fault. <laughs> Some people just ain't wrapped tight, you know. <laughs> How about, it may be more for you ladies, anybody here ever stub their toe? Anybody ever do that on purpose? And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, something's starting to click here. Uh, I got something going on in my shoulder. I, I guess it's arthritis. And isn't arthritis just a medical way of saying you're an old coot? <laughs> <laughs> that thing is worrying the life out of me, y'all. And it'd be one thing if I was left-handed. I don't know how to do nothing with my left hand. Nothing. Swing a hammer, good luck, nail. But you know what I found myself doing? I'm trying to get my left one to help the right one. And I'll grab that hammer with both hands. Hey, this might work. You got ready to pick up a sheet of plywood the other day. Reached down and they go, oh, I don't think that's going to work. Well, wait a minute. I ain't going to shut the job down. I would like to get paid this week. Let me see if I can do that with a left hand. And I'm thinking, whoa, it's starting to click, starting to click. When that one can't do, the other steps up to help it. Why is that? Because we're part of the same body. Amen. Anybody here ever got an award? Blue ribbon, crown to put on your head, letter in high school. Your whole body gets excited, right? You're going to walk up to the front of the room and get your certificate. Guess who's going with you? Both feet, both legs, all the other unmentionables. They're all going up there to get that thing together. I'm thinking, well, that's probably a foolish way of looking at it. And then I stop and think, wait a minute, 1 Corinthians 12 says, that's the way God wants me to look at the body of Christ. Amen. When I whack that thumb, guess what? I ain't got to sit down and preach to the rest of my body. You need to respond, kind of come to that thumb's aid. Mm. Anybody? Good. You may drop the hammer, you may fling the hammer. I usually grab it. I don't know why squeezing something you just whacked helps, but it does. And I'll dance a little and sit down for a while. Just, I mean, do you see the whole thing gets involved there? Why? Because the thumb got whacked. Or your toe got stubbed. Anybody here ever got a cavity? And went to the dentist and got it filled? First time I heard that, I'm thinking, filled, that's like donuts. It's got to be a big time, amen? <laughs> Ain't nobody told me about no half-inch boring machine. He says, hey, look over here. While well, he brings that bit up into your mouth, anybody? Drill, drill. Then he asks you, do you feel anything? <laughs> what do you mean do I feel anything? <laughs> Isn't that a blessing? He's going to drill a hole in your face. Then he's going to fill it. Anybody do that on purpose? As much as I like to eat, had I known, I probably wouldn't have eaten so much all those years. The whole body gets involved. Good night, I reckon.
anybody besides me starting to grasp the idea that God says one of you is a finger and the other one may be a thumb and the other one may be a big toe, but you're all part of the same act. Amen. Period. <coughs> Then I had to stop and ask myself, and I wrote me out, these questions are for me, not for you. Why then? If I can grasp the idea of whacking my thumb, and the whole rest of the body responding and coming to its aid, it's a, why then do I use my words, my actions, and my attitudes to hurt other churches? to alienate other church members or to belittle other church folks. Mm -hmm. You know what? Just because I own a Bible, truth be known, probably three or four dozen of them, don't mean I got it. Amen? Amen. Just because I can read 1 Corinthians 12 and grasp this thing. I'm part of a body, many members, one body. It don't mean I got it. Amen. It's like anything else in the book. I grasp the principle and then I put it into action. I obey what I hear. Amen. Or at least that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Amen. Good night. Let me ask a question. Anybody here know why heaven's going to work? It's because the one body principle will be realized. There. Hey, listen, if this doesn't apply to you and your experience, I apologize right up front. In my experience, we in the church have fallen desperately short of putting this many members, one body thing into practice. Somebody said, you know what? When we get to heaven, there ain't going to be no business meetings. Hmm. One amen. amen. Two, thank you. If I wait a while, I'll get some more. Ain't going to be no voting. There won't be any majority rule. Doesn't that sound, I don't know what that's, patriotic or something. The majority rules. That's a real neat concept. You got a hundred people and fifty-one of them are four, knocking the nuts. But the majority rules. You know what all that means is almost half the church is mad. You know that had to be God, amen. Who in the world fucked that mess up? <laughs> Did you ever find that in the Bible? And then turn the thing around, maybe even worse, the minority rule. Well, we got small group folk in our church. They're far more important than all the rest of us. We're going to let them have their way. Amen? That makes good sense, doesn't it? Y'all looking at me like, what are you talking about? I've been in the Baptist church as a professional for 40 years. I know what I'm talking about. And I've been in the little churches. I was on the parking lot of a big church a time or two, but they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> I know these things. Well, old so and so, his great 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 grandma was a charter member. So what? Zero. No amens. Huh? You to sleep or I just got gotcha. you. <laughs> no, y'all. In heaven, ain't gonna be none of that mess. How about the squeaky hinge getting the oil? That's how most Baptist churches operate. Anybody belly aches long enough, loud enough, somebody will do something. You know that ain't going to happen in heaven? Amen. Ain't going to be nobody belly aching. <coughs> Won't need no oil. Well, I think I'll go to heaven just for that reason, no other. There won't be any big eyes and a little use. In other words, folks in heaven are going to act, they're going to treat one another as complete equals. Complete. Listen, in the body of Christ, there ain't but one Jesus and we ain't it. Everybody else is on level ground. Sinner saved by grace. No, oh, I'm sinner with capital S. No, you're not. Ah, everybody. Even, even territory. 
just read, what was it in the Sunday school court? I mean, the, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is all even. It's all flat and level. Mm -hmm. Heaven's going to work because folks are going to get there and realize we all are here for one reason. Only one reason any of us made it. And it's not me. Amen. Amen. Not me. Do you mean to tell me that won't anybody be getting recognized? Uh, won't anybody be put up on a pedestal? Won't anybody be a big shot? Well, just one. That's Jesus. All the rest of us ain't big shots, where, as the old boy said, we're little duds. You ever needed a gun? Some of y'all are thinking, mm. <laughs> needed a gun, you put a, 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 a dead shot, a, a, a dud in, in the in the wind, whatever, pull the trigger and it don't go off. Lovely. What you needed it for is closer now than it was five seconds ago. Little duds, that's what we are, y'all. <laughs> Good night. 1 Corinthians 12 points out about three specifics. Number one, it addresses this attitude. I'm not important, so I won't get involved. That's verse 15. I'm not the hand, I'm just the foot. So I'm not going to step up and try and, and get involved. I'm just going to sit here till someone comes and makes me feel special. It also addresses verse 21. Not the, I'm not important, but the, you're not important. Funny to me how God knows what goes on in Baptist churches. <laughs> you're not important. You're not the eye, you're just a hand. You're not the head, you're just a foot. In other words, we don't need you around here. That's a blessing, isn't it? Oh. Whoever is truly a disciple of Jesus is in the body and is therefore important to its function. One last thought, I'm going to quit. Because I don't want to make none of the big shots mad. Amen? <laughs> we can err on both ends of the scale. If we're not careful, we can make folks feel not important because we don't let them in our circle, our clique, our thing, our ministry. We don't need you. I remember being at the church some years back. A group of the uh, young ladies, fairly new to the church, had decorated the Christmas tree. <clears throat> and then the old guard came to church. They undecorated the Christmas tree and did it the way they wanted. Y'all, that makes me want to join that church. <laughs> Amen. And then become a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> See it happen, y'all. Hey, listen. Best way to make somebody feel not important is to keep them out of your thing. Y'all, we have got to get into the mentality that what God says is so. Okay. And that if He saves somebody and brings them into this church, they're just important as all the rest of us. Amen. They ain't got to earn a place. I ain't talking about crackpots and goofballs. And folk that are just, you know, where they got the name of Fruit Loop cereals from, well, the genuine article. But when they show up, we got to welcome them in. Just that simple. Amen. If God saved them, take them under your way. Mm -hmm. And then the other end of the scale, if we're not careful, we can make folks feel too important. Right. You say, what? Yeah, you treat them with this sticky, gooey, sweet just to try and talk them into getting involved. And then if you don't continue pampering them and powdering their backside, treating them like royalty, then they pout. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then you got to go beg them to come to church. Well, boy, don't you want to be a part of that church? All you got to do is stick your lip out and you get a little attention around here. I'm having a time in my life. Y'all acting like you're tolerant. I don't know what to do. We'll talk about time. How about that? <laughs> Either end of the scale, y'all. Listen, we're supposed to treat all disciples alike and help folks feel apart just like everybody else. Amen. Period. 
text told us about folk being in jail, folk suffering adversity, but the reason behind it was they're part of the same body, just like us. Just like us. Just like us. I'm glad to be a part of the body of Christ. I'm sorry for all the times I've not acted like the member that I ought to have been. I don't mean church member, I mean body member of the Savior. But I'm glad for forgiveness. Yeah. And I'm glad for its word. And I'm glad for being instructed on how this thing's supposed to work. Amen? Amen. You ever use something the wrong way? Remember the old boy who bought the new chainsaw? This is, we talk about way back, robots. Anybody remember Western Auto? Yeah. I ain't talking about driving through Texas either. <laughs> Stopped in the Western Auto, bought him a chainsaw. Took it home about three weeks later, said, man, you told me I could cut cordwood all day long. Just couldn't, couldn't hardly keep up with it. I can't do but about a cord every three days. Dorothy knows where I'm going. <laughs> the old boy laid it up on the counter. The, the, the counterman took it, looked at it, choked it one time, pulled the cord two or three times, it fired up, and the guy who just bought it said, what's that noise? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love it? <laughs> Listen, one day maybe you'll get an intellectual preacher. I mean, you all like to sit around looking like sour for sevens can have you a time. I love it. Uh, look, God tells us how we make it work. How? Listen, I believe God's got right here in this crowd exactly what He wants right here in this crowd. We got to get us no soybean filler to try and get this thing jump started. God's either God or He's not. Amen. We're either serving a God who knows and does everything or we're not. Amen. I love it, y'all. I love getting in the book and finding out what's going on. You're here today and you've never received Bible Jesus. You say, man, I just can't make my mind up. And that's no problem. Make it up now. He's real. Amen. And if you'd be willing to try, he can prove it to you. Mm -hmm. Just like he did me, just like he did some of <coughs> But you got to make your mind up. Tell him, listen, I'm a sinner. I know I am, because the book says I am, and experience has proven it. But the book says that you're a savior, and that's what I need. I don't need a lawyer, and I don't need a financier, but I need someone who can change me and forgive what I've done. And I promise you he can do it. You make your mind up today, he can make it happen. You're here today and you're a believer, but you've not been walking like you are too. Same thing applies. He can fix you. You make your mind up. Will you pray with me? Father, what a privilege it is to be able to know your son. I know we don't know all of him, but we're knowing more of them now than we ever have before. And what we know is altogether lovely. And we wouldn't trade anything you give us for any sum, any prize. If someone here today is struggling, God, you know what their struggle is. You're the God who calls. You're the God who chooses. You're the God who reaches out. We ask you to do all that to that one struggling here this morning. Please show yourself strong. Show yourself as Savior to whoever reaches out to you. God's spoken to you this morning. I invite you to come while our group sings.